You're listening to season two of the Grief Sense podcast. I'm your host, Mimi Gonzalez, aka the Zillennial Griever. I am a creative, entrepreneur, social impact strategist, and community organizer based in Hartford, Connecticut. But most importantly, I am a griever. Grief Sense is really a safe space for creatives who are grievers. And I really created this space because it's something I wish I had. And sometimes you have to create the things that you wish existed. I am a serial griever where I've experienced significant loss, losing about 20 people before I turned 25 years old. And it was really hard to find community, people who looked like me in the death positive movement space. On the show, you'll mainly hear from Gen Z and millennial minoritized grievers but you also have some advocates on the show who share our experience but also want to amplify our voices and our stories. So what is Grief Sense? What what does that even mean, right? It's not just some fancy name of a brand of the podcast, okay? It's actually a, a term that I've coined to name my experience. Sometimes the words that exist in our vernacular aren't really representative of our lived experience and so thus Grief Sense was born. So grief sense to me really is an inner sixth sense and intuition that's unlocked after experiencing physical loss and it inspires purpose through creative expression, hence grievers who are creatives. So we do this in three ways. One, we embrace our mantra, which is we live life as a privilege. Two, we honor our ancestors and the legacies of our loved ones who have died. And three, we not only normalize talking about grief and death and everything in between, but we really talk about the importance of planning for our death and talking about this in community with our families, what are our death care wishes, you know, and really normalizing that because that is not something that we typically do in our very death phobic world. I hope that when you tune into these episodes that you feel super comfortable. I want you to think that you are in a living room or in Spanish we say the sala, but the grief sala. And I hope that you're able to have tea in your hand or a cafecito so that way you're comfortable. I want you to feel like you're talking to your best friends or your primos or your cousins, people who really understand you and get it. And if you are not a griever and if you are here to learn and listen to the stories that are shared on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Your voice is important too, because guess what? If you're not a griever now, unfortunately you will be one day. And I'm hoping that the insights that you hear on the show will help you navigate that experience. One thing I wanted to also share y'all, grief sense is always going to be lowercase because death, grief, all of that, it can be really scary. So these conversations is to really de-stigmatize death and grief and really making sure it's like relatable, digestible, accessible. And yeah, it can be scary for sure, but let's do it together. Let's be in community together. So with that, welcome to the movement. Welcome to La Familia and welcome to Grief Sense. Let's dive in. Welcome back, listeners of Grief Sense. I am so happy to kick off season two with Pierce Freelon. He is my guest today, and I can't wait for you all to listen to his story. First, I want to say, if you haven't already rated the podcast Grief Sense, that would be greatly appreciated. We want to make sure we are able to reach as many young grievers as possible. And I think that this episode will also help you do that as well. So again, I have Pierce Freelon with me today, y'all, and I can't wait for y'all to listen to everything he has to share. First, I just want to say how I found Pierce. And, you know, I'm, I'm it's a typical day in Grief Sense world. I'm scrolling on by on Instagram and I see this podcast clip of Pierce uh, with PBS and he is talking about grief and he is describing grief as love and it really resonated deeply with me and y'all I made my cells vibrate and I was like oh this person needs to be on grief science if he'll <laughs> if he'll entertain and indulge the idea I gotta shoot my shot I just gotta ask and uh, here we are. So clearly that that went well and we have him on the show and I'm just so grateful for you all to meet him. So Pierce, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, you did a wonderful job introducing me. There's a lot I could say, but I'm going to introduce myself through some ancestors that Love um, I hold very near to me. 
I'm in my office right now, and um, one of my spiritual mentors, a Black woman, a feminist, creative uh, healer in the Yoruba tradition, her name is Omi Shade Bernie Scott. She has a great podcast about menopause, which you should check out, Black Girl's Guide to Menopause. Mm. Um, she told me that when I'm smudging a room, you need to go to all the corners of the room. And whenever I burn Palo Santo or sage in my office, I go to each corner. And in the first corner I go to, I acknowledge and thank my aunt, my auntie mm. Debbie, who passed away from cancer uh, three years ago. There's wow. a, she was a knitter and there's a bust of a kind of a mannequin that I took from her house that is in this corner. In the corner to my left are two ancestors. One is my father, Phil Freelon, whose picture you can see right there just above me. His altar is behind me. Hey, Phil. And, um, <laughs> hey, dad. <laughs> and also one of my, another uh, black woman scholar uh, mentor, Dr. Michele Mugo. She wow. was the chair of the African American Studies Department at Syracuse. So they share wow. a corner <laughs> over here. Then there's Dr. Hall's corner. He was my uh, AFAM professor at UNC, an undergrad, a very beloved mentor whose son makes beats that I, you know, is one of my best friends. Uh, that is Dr. Hall's corner. And then there's a gigantic Afro pick fist, probably six feet tall in this corner. Uh, that was made for a puppet show I did at the Kennedy Center. Uh, mm. My grandmother, Queen Mother Frances Pierce, did hair. And so I associate this corner with her presence, energy, wisdom, and love. So wow. I am Auntie Debbie's nephew. I am <laughs> Phil's son. I am Dr. Mugo's son. I am Dr. Hall's son. And I am Granny Franny's grandson. These are the ancestors that I keep close to me, some of them, and sometimes their positions switch, but today that, that is their orientation. I'm surrounded wow. by love, by care, by uh, wisdom and protection uh, here in my office. And so that is how I will introduce myself today. I love that. And if that doesn't set the tone for group sense, I really don't know <laughs> what it does. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for that. And also normalizing these practices like you can tell it's so evident in in your, just your daily practice and honoring your ancestors and right before i record every episode i do <laughs> have my same <laughs> ritual Beautiful. i love the corners though i need to integrate that now and put in different uh corners of my house right now i have kind of like an altar shrine with uh multiple pictures of my loved ones and yeah inspiring me i love that that was beautiful well, are, are you based in new york I'm in Hartford, Connecticut, actually. Connecticut. Okay, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not too far from yeah. New York, though. <laughs> okay, well, there was uh, the reason I, the other place where I've heard like Four Corners, um, it's actually in the context of North, South, East, and West, mm. is uh, there is a healing collective of Black femmes and women called Harriet's uh, what is it? Apo apothecary. apothecary. <laughs> right, Apothecary. Harriet's Love Apothecary. It. Got it. And uh, I first encountered this collective at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit, and they were Writing holding space. They were holding space for some kind of radical healing from a Black feminist perspective, and they Love. did a lot around identifying how different energy is associated with different directions. And you know, mm. I don't. I, I'm not like deep into the into the what. I was just there and present for the blessing that was very much a part of being in their presence. When Omi told me about the corners, it, that resonated with me because there's these four directions and the four corners. And so anyway, ah, I just beautiful. thought that was a, you know, something that folks can check out, especially if they're based in New York. Absolutely. And I really feel like that also sets the tone for the year, right? We're in a new year. We should really welcome our new year and our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations in memory, in honor of mm -hmm. our ancestors. So that is just beautiful. Thank you so much for that, seriously. Um, and thank you for being here. I am just so excited to experience your energy and your presence and 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 spend quality time with you in this moment. Um, you know, this concept of time actually has been super top of mind for me because 
to really think about how we spend our time mm. doing the things that we are doing and, and how others spend their time, right? Like everyone spends their time differently. And I just really admire all of the work, all of the things that you're doing. And you can really tell how community driven you are, how, you know, family oriented, how, you know, you really care about inspiring the next generation. And if all of those things also with creative expression and music and all of the different things for someone to spend their time like that is really inspiring. And I think so many people can learn so much from you and how they can be spending their time. So that is just what I'm calling into our time right now. But that's just been, yeah, top of mind for me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that a lot. And, you know, I don't see anything. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm not going to say it's not special, but anything unusual about about my time. And this might be a, a message for, for your listeners out there. I know that you, Mimi, recently, you know, stepped away from a corporate job to step into a space that's more passion oriented. And I want to applaud right. you for that. Thank I want to you. <laughs> uh, speak life into and affirm some of the goals and ambitions that you have for Grief Sense. And, you know, I think when you're in divine alignment with your purpose, which mm. I think is the birthright of every person and something that grief really pointed me ever more directly towards mm. being in, in alignment with my purpose, then what is time? Well, I think that at that point, we become like seeds. And mm. when you look at what a seed does and you say, oh, wow, you grew roots and you popped out the ground and you're bearing fruit. It's like, it's like that's miraculous in a way, but it's also what a seed does when it's planted in fertile soil. Mm. It's the most natural thing that a person or, or a being can do when they're mm. being nurtured in the right environment. So mm. yes, I received the Hi. affirmation. <laughs> I appreciate your um, recognition of my time as well spent. And I reflect back to you that this is the natural growth that comes with being in alignment with, with purpose. Mm. And, uh, and I can see that you are also on a similar journey. And yeah. I know that you know more fruit and more abundance and creativity and, and wonder and connection is a, a part of your future, just as as I know when I put a, <laughs> a a cucumber seed in my garden out back that you know with proper light and fertile soil that it's going to be productive. Um, mm. So yeah, just love that. To, Thank yeah. you. I gladly receive that as well. You know, and it's so funny that you talked about this concept of, you know, just the environment and, and fertile soil, right? Because literally I, I described myself when I was leaving the, <laughs> the corporate environment, I was just like, y'all, it's not me, it's you. Like, I know I'm a beautiful flower, but I'm in a pot with toxic soil. As soon Ooh. as I remove myself from this toxic soil, I know yeah. I'm going to flourish. And that's exactly what's starting to happen, right? Like Great. I don't have all of the things that I want or desire yet, but that that's, that's also the beauty of it. It's like enjoying the journey that you're on and yep. just loving yourself mm. through all of the phases and stages. And mm -hmm. I feel like this, this, this past year leading up to where we are now really affirmed to myself what it means to be mm. devoted to Oof. myself. Yes. And just to, just this word of devotion. I really feel mm. like that's my word for this year's devotion. Mm -hmm. It's like, do people really know what devotion means. And I feel like mm. a lot of people think of devotion when it comes to religious practices and spirituality mm. and, and that, that that's definitely valid and true. And I also feel like in terms of relationships, right? We shouldn't yep. only be devoted yep. to our partners or our children or yeah. our friends. What about being devoted to ourselves? Like, yeah. are we being unfaithful to ourselves and our yep. dreams because we're so caught up with nurturing everyone else and neglecting right. us in the process? And so right. literally just leaving such a toxic environment mm. created space for that fertile soil to become fertile for right. me to learn these lessons for me to be devoted. And like, I feel like only when you're in that mindset 
or in that space of devotion and everything that comes with that. Cause it looks different for everyone, but only when you're in that space, can you even begin to understand what you have while you have it and, mm. and, and just mm. t- really taking things as they come and not wanting more, which is okay to always want more abundance. We welcome all the abundance. <laughs> we welcome all the abundance. Um, but it's it's really appreciating what you have as well mm-hmm. in the process mm-hmm. and and continuing to let that nurture this devotion in whatever way that looks like. So, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm loving the cipher. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Pierce, every episode we begin with, you know, who we're honoring today. And I love that that's mm-hmm. how you kicked us off. So thank you so much for that. Um, and with everyone that you did choose to honor and welcome into our space, mm-hmm. would you be comfortable sharing your grief story with anyone you've honored, any specific person, what, whatever's top of mind for you? Um, I'd love sure. for you to kind of dive deep into your grief story. And, and really, and, and the reason why I ask this question is I feel that when you understand our connections to grief, I feel like it provides more clarity and context as to how we spend our time and why why we do so. And so yeah. I was just really intrigued by your story and I think our listeners will be too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let's start with the, since, since he's here, clearly. <laughs> right there. <laughs> that's my dad. Matter of fact, let me bring him in for a close up. This handsome fellow yes. here. There he hey, is. Phil. Nice My to dad, meet you. <laughs> Phil Freelon. Yeah, he um special guy. He passed away from ALS in 2019. Wow. And um you know, it was interesting like I, I mentioned that he helped me get even more close to what my purpose is. Helped me realize and kind of strip away things that um were not necessary as important relevant to my personal and professional growth and development and it kind of happened you know <laughs> it's funny i'm going to use the word accident now but you know things like uh synchronicities and coincidences mm. you know they happened a lot during his transition and uh in my family we've developed a term for that it's called lasagna (laughs) uh lasagna is is basically yeah it's basically like a stand-in for 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 a coincidence or a synchronicity or like Mm. what are the chances kind of moment and the reason (laughs) the reason we call it lasagna is because uh, a couple days before my dad passed away um he had stopped eating and he kind of told us one day like um you know man i could uh, I'm hungry. And we're like, oh, what do you want? You know, we'll get you whatever you want. He's like, oh, man, I could really go for, for some lasagna. <laughs> and we were like, uh, okay, like just lasagna, like of all things. He's like, yeah, man, I could really use some lasagna. And he was kind of, you know, he, he was close to death. So he was, you know, a little loopy, a little sleepy. And and we were all just kind of like, oh, that's interesting. So we're chilling. And and this is my siblings and my mom, our family are there. We're kind of caring for him. He's in the hospice. This is close to the end and we all know it. And so then all of a sudden, within an hour of him saying that, the doorbell rings and we're like, who's here? Like, well, no, we're all here. Nobody went to make a run or anything. We went upstairs, opened the front door. This is at my parents' house that my dad designed. He was an architect. And there was a lasagna sitting on the porch. So we were thinking to ourselves, all right, who who did it? Which one of (laughs) y'all snuck out and grabbed the lasagna? And and no one had left the house. My dad was not on a mobile device at that point. It just showed up on our doorstep. So it took some like, we were like, wait a minute, this is is weird. Is somebody like pranking us? And so what what happened was um, uh, we had this meal train thing, which is, Mm. you know, like a thing that people do, you know, you break your leg and you can't cook for yourself. So people can sign up to deliver food to your house. And uh, this lady who uh, was a professor at North Carolina Central on her own, you know, because it takes lasagna, it takes a minute to cook. She had been preparing it 
for mm-hmm. hours before my dad said anything. There's no way she could have known. She was not in the room, you know, and the, wow. and it just so happened that she had prepared this particular meal. There was no correspondence about what my dad liked to eat or what we wanted to eat. It was just there on the doorstep within minutes of him saying that that's what he wanted. And it was, and Mimi, when I tell you that this was a common occurrence, I am not exaggerating. I this believe was, it. This was wow. just one of those that was so like, come on, like, are you, are you serious <laughs> for real? Like this man manifested some lasagna to teleport to our front door. <laughs> he really um, did. Listen, and we we smashed that lasagna. Just arr, 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 we ate that thing, and um, you know, wow. and so so now when <laughs> in our family when we encounter a coincidence, we say, "Oh, that's lasagna." You know, it happens. That. Oh, I love Listen. that. Yeah. So wow. so I mean, so this is just one of the one example, and I could give you others of the ways in which something something supernatural, something divine, something cosmic. Uh, is afoot. The transition of a life of a brilliant man is coming Mm. to an end in its physical form. He is on the verge of transition into Mm. a new state of being and magic is happening everywhere. That was my experience with his death. And one of the things, this is how it ties back to my, um, right? Take a minute. I felt that in my soul. Take a minute, yes. drink some take water. Take that in, like. That's it. Let's take a deep breath together. That That's... might be a nice way to. Let's t- breathe in for four. Hold for four. Exhale. <sighs> Definitely mm. have to hold space for that. That was, I felt that in my soul. Yeah. Thank you. No, for thank you. That. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you know, one of the other things I'm kind of jumping around in the timeline here, but that's okay. Um, you know, weeks before he passed, I was one of his primary caregivers. I have two siblings, and my mom and his sister and nieces and nephews. We all took part in helping uh, be death doulas. You know, during that mm-hmm. uh, last kind of stretch of his life in this realm. Um, but you know. I was a busy guy prior to my dad's diagnosis and traveled a lot and was teaching at the University of um, North Carolina and doing all types of stuff. I had a PBS web series. There was just like a lot going on. So when he got sick, um, all that stuff came to a halt and Mm. so that I could be present for him. And I'm so grateful for that. Wow. What a uh, gift. Yeah. Yo, it was the best gift in the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I used to kick it over there sometimes for, you know, to give my mom a break. I would be there for eight hours at a time, sometimes 12, sometimes a whole day. And, uh, you know, it's kind of boring. Like (laughs) after we're done (laughs) checking in on what's going on, you know, 90 minutes, two hours, he's taking naps. He's moving slow. Like I help him stretch. Uh, ALS is a disease where your body kind of gradually paralyzes. So he needed help with movement. And so Mm -hmm. that stuff was labor intensive and work intensive. But I would say 80% of my time there was just nothing, (laughs) just sitting Mm. uh, with nothing to do because I had cleared my calendar and, you know, not necessarily anything interesting or new to talk about with my dad. So there was a lot of time for a kind of a, of a slow, gradual morning, a slow breathing, mm. a slow quiet. And in the, in the space that that created, I discovered a lot of music. I had been in a band called The Beast. We did like hip hop and jazz and, and um, it was great. We released a bunch of albums and toured and, you know, had a great thing going, but then I'm a dad, I'm a father of two. And uh, I used to write songs about my kids all the time, all the time. Like we would be in the car, I'd be like, hey, click your seatbelt, clickety click, (laughs) click, 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 clickety, 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 clickety. I would take out out my phone and I would like be like, oh, that's a jam, like clickety click. Like, (laughs) you know, I'd take out my phone, I'd leave a voice note, I'd put it in my pocket, right? And, and, And I never really went back to listen to what I did until I was kind of stuck at my dad's house for multiple hours and I'm 
looking through my phone to show him pictures of like, oh, remember this is Halloween of 2018. Here's Justice's birthday. Here's, you know, Stella's recital. Like we're going through my phone and I'm like, oh, look at these videos where I'm beatboxing wow. something to the wow. kids. Look at these voice notes that I've recorded going back to 2012, 2011, 2010, when they were little babies. And I was like, wow, I have a, I have like, and, and so what I did, Mimi, over multiple days, every time I went over there when I had some downtime, I started to categorize and organize this raw data. Every time I had wow. a voice memo that was, and I listened to them all, because I had the time to do it, I would put it in a folder. And when I looked at that folder, uh, this is before, well before he passed, maybe six months before he passed, I had like 300 songs. Wow. And, and I was like, and in my mind, I was like, oh, this is just a thing that I do sometimes. No, this was like a, a decade of fatherhood. Wow. Um, you know, different scenarios. We're in the bubble bath. I'm telling them to brush their teeth. We're in the car. I'm driving them to school. Like all different types of scenarios. I would pull my phone out and <laughs> record these uh, little songs, songlets. And so what I discovered in, in that kind of time period caring for my dad is like, wow, I, I have like a lot of hot little songs about kids. Maybe I should do a children's music album. And, uh, wow. and I started working on that album and the album was about fatherhood and it was two tier. A lot of the songs were inspired by my children and being a dad, but then it was also during this period in which my dad was dying and I was reflecting on fathership you know, wow. like, you know, you have relationships. It's like fathership. Right. There's a, there's a job here that for my mm -hmm. dad is ending, you know, or at least part of, part of the job is ending. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an interesting Mimi. I, I, this is so fascinating to me, an interesting reversal, right? Mm. Because my dad is now needs to be fed. My dad needs to be cared for. My dad so, needs mm to be tended to in the same way that a father typically tends to his child, but wow. now the child is providing these things for the father. So that, that was really interesting to me. And, wow. and I just started making these children's songs. And um, my dad passed away in 2019 and I released my children's music album in 2020. And, uh, I, when I tell you I had 300 songs, that is not an exaggeration. I picked I 10 it. of them joints and just put it on an album. And it, wow. was, it was huge. It was on NPR. There was like, I got a book deal. This book, Daddy Daughter Day, was somebody who heard my story on NPR and was like, you need to write a book about this. I got a two book deal. This is my other book. Look at that one. Wow. You know, about and fatherhood. Was this the Black to the Future one? Black album? to the Future or was my second children's the second album. One. Okay. That was a same collection of songs, right? Because it came from the 300 plus, you know, a few here and there. You wow. know, all these songs that I discovered while caring for my dad. That album was nominated for a Grammy. Then Ancestors, which is also nominated for a Grammy. Like right. this whole dramatic career trajectory shift Whew. from from making music for adults, like in the vein of like The Roots or Talib Kweli, it was like kind of political hip hop. And I put that down to make children's music and it and wow. it goes hard, like it bops for all, it, you know. It definitely does bop. I've been bopping to it all week. <laughs> Literally from last <laughs> week to this week, I've been bopping. <laughs> wow. So, wow, like that, I just, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm pr really processing all of that and I'm just, yeah, just honored to be in your presence. And I am just so grateful for your father. And, and I think the word that is top of mind for me right now after you sharing that is just legacy. You know, mm. like what a legacy that he's leaving behind, you know, and you are I, when you were talking about like the role reversal, like I was picturing just like passing the baton kind yeah. of like, this is my legacy. It's yours as well. And do with it what you may and look how you're doing And Like, it's just really beautiful. Um, and it's, and it's, it's like his spirit, his legacy is literally living through you and your family members, but of course, through the music now and other people get to experience his energy right. and his legacy and don't right. even know it. Right. Right. Yeah. I that's mean, that, powerful. That's that's the beautiful thing about it. You know, when I wrote my first album was called D.A.D. And, um, you know, 
what I realized in creating this album is it was as much about being a son as it was about being a dad because Mm. everything that I learned about being a goofy, loving, creative uh, dad, this guy taught me. This guy right here. This guy right here. So it is, and that's part of his legacy. That's part of his legacy. He was an architect. So his legacy also includes buildings and structures Mm. that exist all over this country. The Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History in Baltimore, the um, Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., these are buildings that that came out of his mind and me and my kids, you know, wow. we can walk into these buildings and we can feel his presence. Um, but this is another part of his legacy is is the way that he fathered and mm. the way that he died is a part of his legacy. When I think about my own death journey, this mm. man showed me the blueprint. <laughs> Literally. Like, no pun That's, intended. Yeah, no pun intended. I'm glad you caught that. I didn't actually, but <laughs> that is a great metaphor. He literally yeah. showed me the blueprint for how to die well. Wow. And um, oh my goodness, like I want, I want oh. it exactly like he did, down to the, down to the manifesting meals, just by the speaking lasagna. Out. <laughs> yeah, like wow, what a gift! And what a um, gift! Yeah, I'm. I'm. I am grateful for that because mm. I think he had he had a wonderful, beautiful death. It was so sacred. It was so intimate. It was so another. You want to hear another lasagna moment? I, I do. was. Um, I was right next to him um, when he passed. When he drew his last breath, my mom and sister were asleep in the corner. We had been doing shifts, staying up with him. We knew it could happen any minute. He was in his home, a house mm. that he built in his bed. I was holding his hand and, uh, you know, I'd been up for a couple hours, probably from four o'clock a.m. I was just kind of scrolling on my phone, you know, looking at Instagram, um, passing the time while everyone else in my family was asleep. And I heard him inhale mm. and then nothing. I said, I looked up, dad, Mm. nothing. And I, I put my ear on his chest. I didn't hear anything, sat back down. I looked at my phone. It was 7.02 in the morning. Now, (laughs) 7.02 is the address of our childhood home. 702 Cobb Street. Wow. I laughed, I was like, dad. You're funny. <laughs> like, I went home at 702. Really? That's what we doing? Like, it was another wow. one of these He knew what movies. he was doing. Listen. Wow. He waited. He waited until he 702. Knew. I woke up my mom. You know, I didn't tell her about the 702 thing until probably a day later because, you know, she was just in right. her own grief about his transition. But we talked about it later. I was like, you know, he passed at 702. And she was like, Seven o'clock in the morning? Oh, t- oh seven of two. Mm. Of course. <laughs> it was like, this guy wow. is out here playing cosmic gotcha. <laughs> Just like, it's the cosmic gotcha for me. <laughs> come on. Well, so, so have you have you experienced any lasagna moments after his transition that are in? You want to hear like, one? I'll from- give you another one. I do. One. I'm living for you- this right now. Listen, it happens so damn often, it's not even funny. Here's another one about 702. So um, this summer, so first of all, my third album, which was nominated for a Grammy this year, is called yes. Ancestars. It's an album with my mother. This summer, we did a puppet show with a, a, a puppet troupe called Paper Hand Puppet Intervention. Mm. The whole puppet show has puppets um, inspired by are the songs on our album. So we're basically like scoring a 90 minute play with these giant puppets um, about death and grief and transition and life and transformation and healing. Mm. That's what the show is about. And so opening night, first of all, I'm like notoriously late 
to everything. You're lucky <laughs> I showed up here on four yeah, minutes early. You, that was great. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know what came over me, but um, all summer <laughs> we're rehearsing this puppet show. I'm late. I'm late. Late. Listen, I'm not, I'm not a diva or anything, but I believe that like that like black people time. CPT is cultural and you know I show up when I get there and when I get there I put in work so mm -hmm. what do you want from me so anyway period so fast forward <laughs> fast forward to opening night is opening night I know I have a reputation for being late and I told the, the director I was like look man we're gonna start right on time tonight it's gonna be awesome so it's like and the show starts at seven so uh, it's like 6 55 I'm ready because I'm introducing the show I'm like, I'm ready to go out. And then at seven o'clock, somebody grabs my shoulder. They says, don't go out yet. I was like, what, what is it? They're like, there's something wrong with the sound. The sound guy, like the band, there's something up with the band. And I was what? like, oh God. And I was like, where's the director? I need to find him. His name's Donovan. I was like, where's Donovan? Where's Donovan? I want him to know that we're not late to, because of me. <laughs> like <laughs> someone else is responsible for us being late. Cause I told him we're going to be on time today. So uh, finally, I'm standing there backstage, and finally, the 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 person is like, "Okay, you can go on now. You can go on now." And I'm like, uh, "Okay, well, how late are we? What time is it?" And he's like, "It's seven two. I was like, "Okay, Bruh. well, all there right, Daddy O, I see you." Okay, Dad. <laughs> so I went out there and introduced the show, and the whole time I was like, "He just had to say something. Like, you just had wow. to say something." He just had That's to mess beautiful. up some little sound thing so that I could step out at 702. And, you know, afterwards, of course, nobody wow. knows this except my mom. But I explained to the director afterwards. I was like, first of all, I want you to know we were not late because of me. <laughs> it was someone else's fault. <laughs> secondly, <Right. laughs> secondly, let me tell you when we started and why we started then, <laughs> the, 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 the celestial reason why. My dad prevented the show from starting so that we could start at 7.02. And from that day forward, we never started the show until 7.02. And we did 27 shows. It was wild. Wow. It was a long summer. But um, yeah, that's just- Wow, that's so Mimi, beautiful. I could tell wow. you 50, 50, 11 more stories of cosmic synchronicity, coincidence, uh, what my friend Jesse Huddleston calls divine providence. Mm. Um, where it's just like, yo, what are the chances? This is wild. Wow. And, yeah. Uh, and it, and it's so normal now, like the magic of it. It's not that I, I, I appreciate it, but it doesn't surprise me anymore. It's the standard. Right. It's normal. Yeah. It's normal. Mm -hmm. And I always say, I always say, okay, hey dad, or hey, granny Franny. Hey, Dr. Mugo. Hey, auntie Debbie, what you want? Right. You know, like, what's the message coming through today? Like, what's, what's the message? Because yes. I'm right. you got my attention. So, what's right. the message? Just come, right. come on, give it to me. Come on, give it right. to me. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, it's so interesting because you know, and I was talking to you a little bit about uh, grief sense before we started recording, and like, it's a very multi layered definition, and it's like a living, breathing definition of grief sense because I feel like a lot of that is in order to even pick up on these synchronicities you have to be in a state of receiving and mm. to understand that 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 is a thing right because there's yep. a lot of people who you know different beliefs different and that's mm -hmm. completely fine right who won't even have or be in this state of reception for yep. for gifts like this because a they may be totally closed off to it b right. they may just not know right yeah. and to be in that state of reception, I honestly think that's grief sense. And and to be able to pick up on those things, it's it's really beautiful. And it's a gift yeah. that I wish a lot, lot of more people let themselves be in that state because we're conditioned to reject the things that we don't understand. Right. right. When were we ever going to conceptualize or understanding our parents leaving us or people that we really deeply care about dying? But guess what? That's part of a natural part of the human experience. Unless you experience loss of that direct impact, I, I just I truly feel that you wouldn't be locked into this side of mm consciousness and so yeah. sometimes i think about like you know sometimes we hear different podcasts or different you know people talking about it in the media and in science that 
we don't use the, the majority of the capacity of our brains. So I would be particularly interested in looking at the brains of people who are grievers and especially mm. people who have experienced a lot of loss because I, I yeah. really do think that we're tapped in to a part of our brains that other people are not. And like there, there are things that we simply cannot <laughs> explain, but they're happening. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's grief sense, seriously. So Yeah, you know, what's interesting, <clears throat> I would also be curious to have a neuroscientist plug some grievers up and see what, yep. what's going on, right? Yeah. Because it's different. And I, I think that there's something about grief that silences nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. It's like part of what, even prior to my dad's transition, ALS is a diagnosis. It took a couple years for him to die from, but every day we were, we were grieving from the inevitable mm -hmm. kind of slowly approaching right. uh, death march. And there was a lot of noise in my life. There was a lot of trips and traveling and work and grading papers and writing scripts and songs and concerts. And um, those are all, a lot of those things are great. And I thought were not just uh, designed for my purpose, but appropriate for me at that time, right? Mm. Because those skills that I learned doing those things helped me once I found what my true purpose was be prepared to um, to step into the work that I've been called to do. Mm. Um, but the other thing is like, there's not a lot of room for nonsense when grief takes up so much space in your mind. And so it, it, it that part. quiets and silences the distractions in such a way that open you up to receiving. Mm. Um, and I don't know necessarily that grief needs to be the catalyst for that type of awareness or awakening. In fact, I think that, you know, in our culture in particular, there's a lot of distractions and a lot of noise and social media and television and consumerism and capitalism. It's just full of blah, blah, blah constantly. Right. And perhaps our ancestors who had less um, information coming in may have had more of an opportunity to be connected in a way that is uh, difficult to do uh, in this mm. day and age. But um, I'll tell you another part of my dad's legacy that is in alignment with that. So this is a book I wrote about my dad. It's called Dad and me, Daddy and Me Side by Side. It's about going camping with my son. Everyone and, go buy uh, it. <laughs> go buy it. So this is one of the things. I put this in both of my books. Um, wow. This says, resting beneath the same magnolia tree as we sit still, listen, and breathe, just like the breathing mm. we just did, right? My dad wow. would take me out in the woods and he would say, close your eyes, you know, open your heart and listen. And we would just sit there and listen. Mm. And at first it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> I hear running water, I hear trees, I hear the breeze, I hear birds, you know, and it's just a mm. moment to, it's just a moment to stop and to pause and to be. To be present. To be present, right? Mm, yeah. And and that was a technology. He was drilling that into my head from a very young age. He learned this from his grandfather. I've taught this to my son and my daughter. And those are the states in which you are able, most able, when the antenna is wide enough to be receptive. And the more you train and, the, you know, every time you take a moment to to and space for yourself to be present in that way. It's almost like you're cleaning the dish, you know, of your satellite. Mm. Um, having done that meditation that morning puts you in a position to receive that message that evening or that later that week or whatever. And, uh, and what grieving sometimes does is it, is it gives you an, it's like a, it's like a storm that washes all the debris out of your satellite in, right. in a way that is cleansing and uh and really hones your signal because there's not yeah. much more that you can listen to and <laughs> deal with when you're dealing with the loss of a of a mighty loved one right and um right or a big feeling of any kind right um and so i think that's i think that's what the connection is but 
you needn't go through like a hard situation to just daily be right. polishing your satellite. Yep. Um, and that's the, that's the lesson since the death that I take as like, oh, I, I've, I've stumbled on to access to this uh, transmission, right? Mm -hmm. How do I maintain my relationship to it? How do I honor right. the, uh, the, the contact that I have with the divine intelligence? Mm. Um, and you do that through uh, practice, or I do that, let me say, through practices that um, nurture my capacity for presence Yes. Um, including, to your point about grief sense, uh, creative practice, ritual, mm -hmm. smudging, sage burning, meditation, yoga, being quiet out in the woods and listening to the birds and the trees and the rivers mm. and, and the you know and the crickets, like those right. things, those things heighten my senses in such a way that allow lasagna to be on my plate every night. You know that word play right there. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's <laughs> uh, what I'm eating, and uh, and I'm and they're serving it. Those ancestors that they I they serving it up. Dishes on dishes. And to that point, if you are tapped into your purpose or just connected to really doing the things that you want to do, doing the things that will maximize your time here in this physical form, this vessel that we have is not always going to be alive. I mean, I do truly believe our spirit will continue on in whatever way. But with this vessel that we have, we have this experience now. What are we going to do to maximize it? How are we going to spend our time? And I think the more present we are, the more, you know, these different practices that we can do to practice being present. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm having this, I'm thinking about set point and tolerance. So like, in set point, I'm really big into like manifesting and we talk about, you know, if you have your set point now, right? And if you're continuing to to be in this state of manifesting and abundance and really being mindful of the words that you choose when you call the things that you want into existence, you're only going to increase or improve and go to another set point. And then you're going to be able to build from there. It's the same thing when you're working out, like your tolerance, the things that you can handle, you're going mm -hmm. to be at another set point. And that way, when you do experience a catastrophic event or something really big and monumental in your life, you have your set point, right? And you have your foundation that you're building. So it won't be completely thrown off because you've worked so hard to get to where you are today. But if you never start, imagine right. all of the things that you could be calling into existence and working on that you aren't because right. you aren't doing the things that you need to do to be connected to your spiritual assignment, your purpose, mm -hmm. your mission, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. or honoring our loved ones that have passed away, honoring the resilience of our ancestors mm -hmm. that are no longer here to everyone tuning in. You know, if this ain't a reminder to, you know, get hey. locked in with your missions, like, in, it's, it's time, it's time. And sometimes you don't have to look, so far away sometimes you have to look into the legacies of your people oh yeah into what you want your legacy to be right yep. and really like doing the research on your ancestors and really mm -hmm. letting yourself let your craft even like if there's something that you have a craft whatever that is whether that's writing it's creating content mm -hmm. music art whatever let your craft be your compass because Nine times mm. out of 10, you will be honoring not only yourself, but your family and yep. your entire ancestral lineage. Yep. I'm a true believer of that. Let's go. I love it. <laughs> so, I love it. Something I wanted to say, and I loved how you brought up the Daddy and Me book, The Magnolia Tree, because mm. I saw that on the cover, the album cover of Ancestors, there was an altar and there were a mm -hmm. whole bunch of magnolia flowers there. And I think what a lot of, if you're not familiar uh, with this flower, it's very powerful um, in the in the sense of grief world and honoring our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Or well, let me, let me take that back. On the album cover of Ancestors, there's miracles on there. And just the color yellow is very mm. symbolic of connecting with our ancestors mm -hmm. after they transition. And I really wanted to bring that up here and talk about this album of Ancestors. Even just the word ancestors into Ancestors, I think everyone mm -hmm. should <laughs> refer to their ancestors that way. I most <laughs> certainly will. 
Um, what a beautiful album. And I can hear the different like cultural influences and things like that. I really loved Build an Altar. That song was mm. so beautiful to me because it's it's doing what we're talking about now, right? Kind of democratizing access or just normalizing the practice of honoring yeah. people who have died and 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 yeah. making that a very normal thing instead of grieving in isolation or like oh no we shouldn't talk about that and keeping it hush hush it's like putting it out in the open that that this is a very normal human experience yeah. that we're all going to lose someone that we love and let's do it in a way that you know in creative expression with music, yeah. with community. And so mm -hmm. I really just wanted to get your, you know, motivation behind the album, even, you know, when you were writing that song, just anything top of mind for you and talking about ancestors and what you want people to take away from that. Yeah, well, I think one way to, um, to, to be present um, to the presence of your ancestors an important way is through and an, and an ancient way mm. of ancestral veneration is through altar building. And <laughs> this is a practice that, you know, African cultures, indigenous cultures, East Asian, Southeast Asian, Indian cultures, there's a ton of people who do this. And, um, you know, growing up in the States, it's just not a part of the zeitgeist of the culture here. In fact, uh, it yep. can be even demonized as, you know, witchcraft or, you know, anti-Christian in this kind of Judeo-Christian hegemonic um, right. society that we live in. So for me, it's a very anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, like radical act to right. call upon your ancestors to build altars to celebrate them and to ask for their guidance. That song, um, you know, you mentioned the flower, um, the, I can't pronounce it, Sampasucha is, is it's like a, the flower of the day of the dead. Um, day of the dead, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my brother from, um, uh, who's featured on the song, uh, mentions the name of the flower and the Spanish uh, proper pronunciation but they are marigolds mm -hmm. and, you know, Day of the Dead is a really interesting ritual that is a three day recognition of those we have lost. And, um, you know, there's different days with different focuses. The third day is about um, infant loss and losing young ones and children. There's just, you know, another one of these topics that is very taboo and very something people deal with in the shadows. And um, lo and behold, yeah. a lot of families have dealt with that issue and yeah. they have a whole day the third day the day of the dead specifically for losing children um because it is a yes. nuanced type of grieving there's a type of uh grieving that you expect to come from losing an, an elder a parent a grandparent you know using a long, young one is a particular or a peer uh for folks who who may be young when they experience loss for the first time is right. a is a nuanced type of grieving and uh and a shock in a way that you expect spring summer winter fall winter it's like and then spring comes again you don't expect uh right. spring to be followed by winter it is shocking but then how do we deal with that as a people as mm. a human species well right. we create art right we we build ritual um, we make masks, we, uh, burn candles, we, um, pour water out. This is an African tradition called a libation. We put food out for our ancestors, give them something to eat. We remember them. We, we say their names. We tell stories about them, etc. These are, uh, rituals that, um, are rooted in a ancient healing practice that we've been removed from. How does that Absolutely. show up in the U.S.? Halloween, right? <laughs> you get a you get a sliver of it. It's candy and right. costumes, but it's not it's not the day of the, it's not the Dia de los Muertos. The the Chicano and indigenous ancient traditions around ancestral veneration. Mm. That or I mean, you got 
You got Mulan, the the problem. What's your cat's name? Mulan the Menace. <laughs> Mulan the Menace, right? But if you ever watch the movie Mulan, the Disney movie, it you know begins mm -hmm. with a young girl who is in communion with her ancestors. They each got a statue. They got an That's incense why her name holder. Is Mulan. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Yep. So she knows yep. about it. When I think speaking of Disney. You know, Coco is another really good movie that goes into deep and intimate detail around these rituals that are really powerful. But on an right. individual basis, my dad's altar is full of black superheroes. That's just the uniqueness of his altar. It has a photo of him and it has some artifacts that, that really summon his energy into the space. These mm. things are, are healing technologies. They are channeling tools mm. and... They go way back. So yeah, way back. We, we have to reclaim that. We have to reclaim yes. that because we've been removed from it. We've been brainwashed out of understanding the power of it. For me as a musician, music is my love language. It's my art form. It's my gift, my talent. My purpose mm. is connected to my ability to write songs. So yeah. a song like Build an Altar is a song that celebrates this ancient African and indigenous tradition. Mm. Um, a song like Little Mushroom uh, is a song about celebrating transformation and growth that comes from death. Mm. Uh, literally, as in the mycelial network. Can, I don't know if you could see my background, but I have mushrooms growing, mushrooms and flowers little, I, growing out of skull. So yeah. <laughs> Yo, listen, that, that, how does yep. the lyric go? It goes, uh, hey, little mushroom growing on a tree that's fallen, that died mm. in the forest. You turn a grave to a garden. And it's a kid's song. This is for children. Yeah, exactly. You turn a grave to a garden. Hey, little mushroom, even when death is tragic, you're like magic. You reabsorb life and keep balance. It's like, how do we wow. make kids uh, expose kids to the beauty and it is beautiful Absolutely. of life the beauty of life there are four seasons and you wouldn't want winter to last forever that no nope. those are bad years when winter stretches on forever you don't want summer forever you know there's turnover there is right. a way in which <clears throat> death sustains and produces new life that's how yes. and why we're all here. It's the most yes. natural thing a human being can do. Mm -hmm. So uh, how about we celebrate the reality of our existence instead of living in fear or in the dark, kind of cowering from something that's a little mysterious. Like the mystery could be part of the beauty of it. You don't need absolutely. to know everything. Like, <laughs> Right. Come on. Right. How did the lasagna get there? I don't fucking know. It just showed exactly. up. Just showed up. <laughs> just just appreciate the blessing and pass me a fork. Like that's the <laughs> I'm ready to eat. Right. Come on. Like wow. yeah, so oh, this is so beautiful. And you know, I'm so I'm so grateful. I love how you talked about Dia de los Muertos cuz I say Dia de los Muertos is every day hmm. for me. It's every day. It should be every day, right? Just how people talk mm -hmm. about Valentine's. Valentine's Day should be every day. Mother's Day, <laughs> yeah. Father's Day. That's every day, right? Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. appreciating life while you have it. And in yep. doing so, how are you honoring your people? And yep. so, and frequently I, I talk to, you know, my friends and peers about legacy projects and mm. how literally you are one walking legacy project Pierce. Uh, <laughs> everything you. you have is just living breathing legacy um but you know this podcast is a way for me to not only honor you know my purpose at least what i think is my purpose right but also you know the legacies of guests that i have on the show yep. also honoring it's like uh and i always said this in the beginning my very first episode i talked about how i think podcasts are real they're like digital museums it's like you can mm. visit them and it's a way to keep your legacies um carrying on it's a way to mm -hmm. honor them right you don't mm -hmm. have to physically go into a space to to see legacy you can create it right here and through your art right, right? and so i i just love that and i'm just grateful to have 
been able to also honor your, you know, ancestors and your father and, and everyone Thank who, you. you know, you deeply care about. That's that's really special to me. And I love everything that you said. I have a couple more questions. One is with, you know, all of your talents and your gifts and everything like that, you know how you hear sometimes, you know, what's what's a role model or who's someone that you looked up to growing up? I think that you would appreciate this instead, though, is that, you know, it really does take a village. And so I'm just curious to see or hear who was part of your village growing up and who inspired all the the many different roles and hats that you wear today. You could talk about your village growing up or your village now, but I'm curious to see that because I don't think one person nurtures every single thing that we need, right? It takes a village and things sure. that, you know, nurtured our dreams. So yeah, yeah, just curious. Well, um, you know, I need no look no further than the than the room that I'm sitting in with the names that I've already mentioned in in my right. intro. I can start with my grandmother, uh, Queen Mother Frances Pierce. She was a um, you know hairdresser and uh, an organizer. She was a, a public school teacher and a deeply spiritual woman mm. who used to rhyme all the time. Um, Look at that. Holly, <laughs> listen, how about that? As a as an extension of my legacy, she would say, and you hear a lot of her uh, on Black to the Future, which is really about um, Black women and um, the things that they taught me. There's a song in there called Attitude of Gratitude. Right. That was one of her things. You got to keep an attitude of gratitude. And, mm. you know, that's not always the easiest thing for a 12 year old to understand or appreciate, you know, because she tells you that right. when you're like, can I get some uh, fruity pebbles? And she's like, <laughs> mm, no, and you're like, well, can I get anything good, sweet? She's like, no, we well, here have some raisin bran. Raisin bran, you better keep an attitude of gratitude, you know? <laughs> At least you got some cereal. Love that. I'm sitting, there, um, you know, I'm sitting there hating on my raisin bran instead of being grateful. So, you know, at the time it was kind of like whatever, but, you know, over time, especially after she passed, those seeds that she planted in my mind became the mantras that guide my daily practice. Like, mm. I'm grateful every day. Yeah. And I think of her and thank her for that wisdom that she uh that she placed in the mind of a knuckle-headed little boy <laughs> that um that that and it took some time again going back to seeds it took time for those seeds to germinate and um you know and to bear fruit and uh you know I, i've been thinking a lot about that another one she said was um no was a love word mm. you hear that mm. Listeners of the Grief Sense podcast, <laughs> let me drop that gem on you one more again. I feel the say spirit that one more of, time. I feel the spirit of Queen Mother Frances <laughs> Pierce coming through me. She said, <laughs> "Honey, no is a love word." Mm. Okay, well, that is another one that that took some time to really wow deeply internalize. No is a love word. First and foremost, it's a love word to yourself, mm. right? You are extending love and courtesy and care to yourself by saying no when you need to. You are creating space for opportunities and abundance and, and energies that belong to you, that would not be accessible to you Unless wow. you offer the loving no, mm. that is your birthright, you know? So, period. <laughs> period. Period. Like, so, that's who poured wow. in me, Queen Mother. Um, you know, she had a lot of, she had a lot of gems like that. And again, like, I'm trying to picture myself at seven, eight years old in Cambridge, Massachusetts, visiting her for the summer. I want something. She says no. And then, when I gave her the stank face, she says, you know, no is a love word. <laughs> like, Ugh. it's hard to be on the receiving end of that and truly appreciate it. But right. for us, for us grown folks out there who um, knew a no was 
necessary and we didn't give it mm. and and we sat in in resentment or in in misalignment because we didn't have the care and love mm. to offer what was supposed to be offered with a with a spirit of joy and a spirit wow. of of grace um that that does that means not only is the answer no but you're welcome <laughs> like <laughs> you're welcome yes and you're welcome there's a mirror there right so you're welcome to yourself right but right. also to them because they don't want you doing whatever they ask you to do half-hearted or when that right. was meant belonged to somebody else or you know wow. you're welcome for that no and that's what a love word it's not just a nice thing it's a love word it's a care it's a it's a courtesy mm. for you to offer that so anyway that and and here's the love other it. thing about this that um tie it back to my dad my brother and i go jogging every week um we run five miles and uh and we talk and he was telling me that i hope he's okay with me sharing this i'm sure he will be it's not a super private thing but he was telling me how our dad when he was young and my brother struggled with social anxiety you know just kind of an introverted guy and being in groups kind of made him a little nervous so my dad when when we were young told him you know son unclench your fist mm. you know if, if your hand is unclenched then you can be in a posture of receiving friendship conversation, job opportunities, you know, partnership, wow, uh, video game buddies, anything, you know, but <laughs> when you walk around with your hands clenched up like that, mm. then then Gotta nobody can my fist. <laughs> listen, unclench your wow. fist. So this was maybe, I don't know, 1989, 92, something, you know, my brother's uh we had the same birthday. So he's turning forty three this year. I'm turning wow. forty in two weeks. So my dad gave my brother this advice. Um, it was not until very recently that my brother truly began to understand and remember and um, uh, put that advice into action. Mm. So uh, what that indicated to me was something, going back to the metaphor of the seed planting, something really interesting like you know, when my dad died in 2019, he could have said, shit, like, you know, I, I tried with my son, my eldest, he just didn't, he just didn't do it. I mm. failed. You know what I mean? He could have felt mm. a sense of regret, like maybe mm. I should have tried harder or, you know, in, in trying to, to convey this message. What I learned when my brother told me that finally, you know, he is, he's unclenching his fist and opening himself up to some new social abundance, which is flowing in uncontrollably at this point, right. um, is that my dad did his job completely. It was to plant the seed. Mm. You are not in control of when that seed cracks open, germinates, you know, mm. spreads, grows, flowers, blooms, bears fruit. None of that is your responsibility. It's just to plant the seed. And wow. that is enough mm. because my dad absolutely achieved his, his goal. And even though he never saw that that's what happened, you know, the soil wasn't ready to receive the seed. It was just crusty sitting on the top. Like sometimes it takes a, a crack in the soil from, mm. I don't know, maybe a trauma, maybe something you're grieving about, mm. you know, that forces the ground open. So now it's in there. Now it may take three, four years to pop out. Um, wow. You know, it's like- Powerful. Uh, to, really powerful, really powerful. And just a reminder that, you know, if you if you have kind words or good advice or, or a channel, to pass something on to someone that it's not your responsibility necessarily to make sure that it clicks or to get mm. it in there. Just pass the seed on and and then let go because it's mm. not your responsibility to to 
to do more than plant the seed. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, so on that note and kind of wrapping up here too, what advice would you give to young grievers who maybe also be musicians, artists, creatives? Like what would your advice be to maybe someone experiencing grief for the first time and really doesn't know what to do with it and they're really young and maybe we can be part of their village in this moment? What would you pour into them at this moment? Oof. Um, I would say uh, be present. That is my big advice. If you have big feelings, big feel them. <laughs> I love it. I love receive, it. Receive the information, the emotion, the moment, and what it has to offer you. Mm. Um, there's this uh, interesting... Um, uh, anecdote I heard about buffaloes. Have you ever heard this? That they run uh, when a storm's coming, what a buffalo oh, does? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for those who may not know it, it's that buffaloes are <laughs> unusual because, you know, when a storm is approaching a buffalo, uh, they run towards the storm. And, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people were like, well, why is that? Buffaloes hate being wet, by the way. It's not like they're just waiting for a shower. <laughs> <laughs> they hate being wet. Yep. Why do they run towards the storm? Well, when you think about it, it makes complete sense. When you're, if the storm is coming this way and you're running this way, the quickest way through the storm is actually to run towards the storm. If you stay mm. put, the storm will go over you at a, at a slow pace. If you run away from it, actually the storm Chasing will you. be, it, it chases you and it goes over you the longest. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to mess yourself up, run away. Mm. You know, if you're fatigued, wow. stay put, it'll be over. But if you want it, if you want to get through it the quickest, you know, which is not always the goal, but run towards the storm. Mm. I there's love no, that. There's no avoiding getting wet. Run towards the storm, face it, sit with it, be present to it, you know, and then you're you're in the best position to choose what to do next. Um, you could catch up with the storm and get some more wet if you want. You could sit and dry. You could walk towards the horizon and and uh, try to warm up. But there you have the most choices. If you're running away, you have the least amount of choices. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be my advice. Would be if the grief is a storm, and to be clear. Though the storm in this metaphor is usually seen as a bad thing, I don't see grief as a bad storm. Mm -mm. It's a storm in the way that a storm is a storm. It is a rain delivering mechanism. Right. With, without storms, there wouldn't be fresh water. So thank God for the storm. Or right? rainbows. <laughs> there wouldn't be rainbows. There wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be uh, plant life for us to eat if there weren't storms uh, feeding the soil. So mm. to be clear, though uncomfortable, storms are absolutely necessary. So right. first of all, thank God for the storm. Mm. Um, but what do you want your relationship to it to be, especially if mm. you don't like being wet? Um, I would say run towards it. Uh, and that gives you the most options. Beautiful. As you were saying that, I, <laughs> please tell me why I was singing If I Ruled the World. <laughs> in my ah. head like walk right up to the sun right like walk that just right kind of the sun. i love it hand in hand yeah so that yes. that was like what was playing in my head when you were saying that but well pierce how can people get tapped in with you how can they amplify your work how can they connect with you i really just want to amplify all of the amazing things that you are up to um yeah so shout out all the things shameless plug it all away how can people get tapped in with you Great. Well, uh, my name is Pierce Freelon, and that is where you can find all my things. That's my website. That is my uh, handle on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, et cetera. So awesome. Um, yeah, you can you can find me and all my things um, just <laughs> by searching my name. Awesome. 
Well, y'all, please listen to all three albums. D.A.D., you said, right, there's Black to the Future and mm -hmm. Ancestors. And y'all, yep. I just really admire people who are doing different ways and, you know, really amplifying their creative expression, but also doing it in a way where it pours into the next generation. And I feel like, Pierce, you and your mom as well are just doing really beautiful work um, in, in community, in honor of our ancestors, in, in in honor of legacy and honor of being present and and really just tapping into this concept of letting creativity be your compass because I really truly believe that only beautiful things are gonna continue to happen from that the fruit y'all gonna be able to bear all the fruit you want for a very sustainable long time and I'm really hoping and, and, and calling that what I think is beautiful about this too is you're inspiring the next generation to do that as well um, and not a lot of people are taking intentional thoughts or, or measures or efforts to really, you know, include the youth with their work. Um, and I just really love how you're doing that. So please keep doing what you're doing. I'd love to continue amplifying your story. And thank you for being on, on Grief Sense today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. All right, listeners. Well, thank you for tuning in. Please give us a rating on wherever you consume your podcast. Like, subscribe, comment, all of the things. And thank you, Pierce, again. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Grief Sense Familia, that wraps up another episode of the Grief Sense Podcast. If this resonated with you, please feel free to share with someone who will appreciate it and tell a friend to tell a friend. Also, I'm a firm believer that feedback is a gift. So, you know, I'm just saying, I won't be mad if you decide to leave a review and a rating of your experience on the podcast so far. Also, let's help each other find community in grief and let's amplify these stories far and wide. Thank you for tuning in. In solidarity y con mucho amor, Mimi.